So uh, this afternoon, we are going to be going over this as lecture 21, uh, geographic distributions, uh, primarily of marine fishes. And we're going to talk about some specialized adaptations. In particular, you know, uh, when we talk about marine fishes, like this here is the fang tooth. Um, these things are sort of adapted for life in the deep, deep sea in many cases. And so lots of crazy adaptations that we're gonna talk about today in this, uh, in this lecture on geographic distributions of fishes. But before I get into lecture 21 material, I'd like to finish up just a handful of slides from uh, the last lecture uh, on the history of ichthyology. <clears throat> And so I'll come back to this talk here and I'll, I'll finish up with this one. So when we ended last time, uh, we were talking about uh, John Audubon and how he had played this trick on Raffinesque. And now, you know, this is kind of, these are two famous naturalists, you know, uh, Raffinesque and Audubon very famous people. And so it, I'd like to just illustrate this because it shows the, the humanity of, of science. And you can see that these guys were, and oh, in the case of Audubon was kind of a, a prankster, if you will. Um, and that Raffinesque himself was quite a unique. And so with that, I'd like to then tell a couple other stories about some famous ichthyologists, um, just to give you an idea of, of some of the crazy stuff that was going on uh, David Starr Jordan is another kind of character. Um, born in 1851, died in 1931. Uh, little interesting facts about David Starr Jordan, who studied fish. He was the, as far as I know, the only person in the United States to have received a master's of science degree before he completed his bachelor's of science degree, if that makes sense. He went to graduate school before he graduated undergrad. Uh, he attended university at Cornell, Butler, and Indiana University School of Medicine. Uh, he was inspired by Louis Agassiz to study fish, and I'll talk about Louis Agassiz in, in the next slide, I believe. Uh, he then went on to become the president of Indiana University, and he also was the founding president of Stanford University. When Stanford first opened, David Starr Jordan was the president. And then he later became chancellor of Stanford University. He was the president of the National Education Association, and he contributed to designing the currently accepted uh, major professor program of graduate schools in the United States. So, uh, prior to this, you know, if you wanted to go to graduate school, it was kind of an independent research uh, endeavor. Uh, you had, I mean, this is back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, you, you had a lot of money and you wanted to spend it, you could pay for tuition. I mean, there, were no, there was no such things as student loans or anything like this. Uh, most of the research back then was privately funded or the professors themselves paid for it. And so the same thing with going to school, there weren't like research assistantships or teaching assistantships or things like this. And so uh, a lot of times you just came to the university with a bunch of money and you had your bachelor's degree in hand and you said, I wanna be a graduate student. And so you sort of had to figure out what you were gonna do. That was part of the challenge was what is the experiment that you're gonna conduct and then uh, identify who was going to evaluate that to give you the degree. Well. Uh, David Starr Jordan was one of the first ones who sort of set up this major professor system where uh, faculty at the universities accept graduate students kind of like as understudies or apprentices. And then the major professor that helps guide that research project. And then also forms a committee to help evaluate whether that project was successful or maybe not worthy of a degree. So he is widely credited as being one of the people who came up with this idea. He was also an expert witness for the Scopes monkey trials. Uh, again, you know, teaching evolution in the classroom. Uh, he did support eugenics. And now again, this was in the early 1900s where this was actually, 
I don't know, sadly enough to say, kind of trendy uh, in the westernized countries to talk about eugenics. And he did support that. Um, so again, not every scientist is perfect. Uh, many fish genera are named after him, uh, also species. He published 650 articles and books on fishes. And he also published in a variety of disciplines, kind of like Raffinesque. Uh, evolution, ecology, population biology, organismal biology. This was sort of the revolutionary time of genetics at this time. This is when we had what was called the modern synthesis of genetics coming about. And so uh, he did branch out into that as well as fish biology. His most famous work is the genera and classification of fishes, a guide to the study of fishes. And rumor has this, again, he was kind of a character. Uh, he may have been involved in the murder of Jane Stanford. Um, so uh, again, he was the president of Stanford University and became chancellor. And Jane Stanford ended up dead. And apparently, I guess they detected strychnine in her, like she had been poisoned. And uh, I don't know if, if Davis or Jordan had anything to do with it, but uh, there was a little bit of a drama there at Stanford University because Jane Stanford was the benefactor then who established the university. So I don't know, just a rumor. So other famous ichthyologists, Rosa Eigenman, a uh, first female ichthyologist, 1858 to 1947. She was the first female ichthyologist. She also was the first woman to attend graduate school at Harvard University. So. Uh, again, studying fish. Um, she described over 150 different species of fishes, was the president of the Women's National Science Club in the United States, and she also was the curator of the California Academy of Sciences uh, for both the fishes and then for the, the collection there. Spencer F. Baird. We sort of talked about Spencer Baird a little bit earlier in regard to striped bass. Uh, 1823 to 1887, he was the first curator of the Smithsonian Institute, uh, Washington, uh, expanded the natural history collections in the Smithsonian from a mere 6,000 specimens to over 2 million. Uh, he published 1,000 papers and books in his lifetime, and he also then was the first commissioner of what would become the United States Fish and Fisheries Commission, which then became the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And again, one of the first things he did was, again, put striped bass on trains and send them from the East Coast all the way across the country to the West Coast to stock them in the Pacific Ocean. And this is, again, not, not long after the, the railroads were built. So kind of interesting. Carl Leavitt Hubbs, Carl L. Hubbs, 1894 to 1979, uh, from my neck of the woods in Chicago. Uh, assistant curator of the Chicago Field Museum of Natural History. I showed earlier on one of the AEC, you learned it here stories about the Tully monster. Again, uh, that was the Chicago Field Museum of Natural History. Uh, he was the first director of the Michigan Institute for Fisheries Research uh, on the Great Lakes. He was also the first curator at the Museum of Zoology at the University of Michigan. And five genera and 22 species of fishes are named after him. The Hubs SeaWorld Research Institute out west is named after him. Um, and he published 712 works during his lifetime. Now, when I, when I, when I point out 1,000 papers and 712 papers, like, look at this. This is a long time ago. You know, it's not like these guys are using the internet or it, like Spencer isn't using computers. I mean, Carl Hubs wasn't either. This was like on typewriters or handwritten stuff that was then transcribed. I mean, this is a, this is a pretty impressive feat uh, back then. Um, very few professors in modern day publish a thousand papers. I'm gonna say that there's a very short list of people in the world that do that. Um, and so that's a pretty impressive task. And in the case of hubs, a lot of times if you ever see the specific epithet of a fish, hubsii, H-U-B-B-S-I, those are the fishes that are named after Carl Hubs. So that's something to look out for. Uh, other notable ichthyologists, uh, Louis Agassiz, 
1807 to 1873 Swiss naturalist, professor of zoology and geology at Harvard University. He was an anti-Darwinian. He uh, did not believe in uh, the evolution proposed by Darwin at the time, and he placed fossilized fishes among the living. Everything was created equally at one point in time, and then things maybe went extinct, but it did, did not evolve. He founded the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology, which is kind of funny. He was a comparative zoologist, but he was an anti-Darwinian. Um, first large fish collection with multiple specimens. In the lab, I sort of told you about the idea of type specimens and how, uh, you know, most people just like would go out and catch one fish, and throw it in a jar and say, well, I've got my one specimen. Well, uh, Louis Agassiz, as a comparative zoologist, noted that not every same not every two fish are the same, even if they're the same species. And so you might want to collect more than just one. And so he, uh, you know, amazing enough that, that that no one had thought of that up until then, but uh, that was his, one of his things. Uh, Charles uh, Gerard, uh, 1822 to 1895, was the Smithsonian Institution's first official ichthyologist. And he was appointed uh, and worked then with uh, Spencer Baird. While at, because Spencer was then the first curator of the Smithsonian. Georges Cuvier, uh, a French naturalist. I showed this picture here uh, of this, this title page of uh, Peter Artetti, again, the grandfather of ichthyology. Uh, look at this, the stamp on the inside cover, Cuvier. This came from Cuvier's library. Published the Natural History of the Fishes that described uh, 4,500 species of fishes, uh, 2,300 new species. Uh, Charles Tate Reagan, 1878 to 1943, was a British ichthyologist, described a number of, of different species, uh, fish species and also was a fellow of the Royal Society. Now this is the equivalent of like the National Academy of Sciences uh, in the United States. So, you know, people who are in the members of the Royal Academy include guys like Isaac Newton and uh, Stephen Hawking and things like this. So uh, very prestigious for a fish biologist. Uh, Charles Henry Gilbert, 1859 to 1928. Uh, he was a colleague of David Starr Jordan, again at Stanford, uh, studied Pacific salmons. Really one of the things that, that we, we know very well right now is the biology of Pacific salmons. And this was started a long time ago. It was very interesting to work on these things um, you know, going back a uh, hundred or so years ago. Uh, and then Albert Carl uh, Gunther uh, was a British naturalist. He cataloged the fish, fishes of the British Museum, described over 6,800 species. Again, first descriptions of 1,700 species of fishes. Also a fellow and vice president of the Royal Society. Very, very prestigious. And so those are some of the famous ichthyologists out there. I always try to add to this list every year. And so if any students out there have famous ones they wanna to add to it, like um, people in their uh, areas of expertise or people that they, they know about that aren't on there, I'd be glad to add them to this list. And it's, I like to grow it. And so please feel free to send me those and I'll, I'll add a little bit of a, like that, four or five bullets or whatever um, on their major accomplishments. But again, amazing things these guys were doing studying fish. So it's an important field. What can I say? So with that, let's move in here into diversity of marine fishes and specialized adaptations. So here's a map of the earth. All right. And uh, we have divided this up then into the Eastern Pacific, which sort of wraps around here into the, uh, the, the Pacific Islands, uh, the Western Atlantic, the Eastern Atlantic, and the Indo-Pacific. Those are our major reason, regions of, of uh, marine environments. You know, there's different, like the Indian Ocean is different than the Pacific. When we look at biology, though, nothing usually stops a fish from swimming from here to here. So we look at habitat congru uh, the congruity of habitats. Uh, really, the one that's interesting is this one here. You know, when we talk about things like the striped bass, despite the fact that they can swim across the ocean, they don't. And likewise, the European sea bass doesn't swim across the Atlantic this way. So 
this is kind of an unusual boundary here. Uh, there, there are a lot of species that actually do re remain sort of a uh, resident, if you will, here. So this is kind of an odd differentiation. So when we look at these zoogeographic regions, uh, we have the Indo-West Pacific that has the highest diversity. And again, when we look at our principles of diversity from freshwater, they apply here. If you're in the tropical area, you most likely have high diversity, warmer, more productive areas, higher energy input, higher diversity, okay? And the second thing is, is I mean, the Great Barrier Reef, uh, that, that thing kind of, if we talk about the Amazon River being the number one freshwater diversity, and we talk about the Mississippi being like one of the top, the number one in North America diversity, uh, Great Barrier Reef sort of nails it as far as marine diversity. It's, it's really pretty extravagant. And we'll talk about that in particular. Uh, then there is the Western Atlantic. And again, this is a lot of coral reefs down here. This is the Bahamas and things like this, really. We're not, when we say Western Atlantic, we're not talking about New Brunswick. We're talking about down here. Okay. Um, again, warmer area. Then that's followed by the uh, Eastern Pacific. And again, this is sort of right over here. Again, the tropical areas right around here, warm water. Um, followed then by the Eastern Atlantic, which is oftentimes, this is pretty cold water up here. And so again, if we follow our, our principles or our dogma of, of, of cooler water has less diversity, I mean, you know, you're up here in Norway and Finland and things like this, very cold, right? And I mean, really, this is really cold. Um, uh, you know, the Eastern Atlantic, I like to say here, there's a sort of subdivision of the Mediterranean which is part of this. And if I was gonna say that the, the greater diversity is gonna be located here in the Mediterranean, uh, you know, I, I sort of put that, that differentiation there, but I, I didn't do it for the Western, I didn't differentiate the Gulf of Mexico. So I just wanna maybe point out that the Mediterranean Sea is in fact part of the Eastern Atlantic system. Likewise, the Gulf of Mexico is part of the Western Atlantic. And then last but not least, again, the least diversity, Arctic, Antarctic, uh, Again, very cold, not a lot of input of energy here, and so not a lot of diversity. So there you have it. The same application or the same kind of understanding from freshwater systems applies then to marine systems. So with that, I'm gonna show you a video here for fishing for toothfish. These are cold water fish. Um, but I'd like to show this video to illustrate to you when we talk about marine fisheries, the volume of fish that are being harvested. And also to show you that this isn't just like, uh, you know, a guy on a boat with a net that's going fishing. This is to show you what commercial fishing is like. These are mobile floating factories. And this goes anywhere from harvesting the fish to processing them and to storing them on the vessel. And then those products are then uh, transported directly into markets or shipping channels uh, at the ports. And so here is fishing for the toothfish.
There's our advertisement.
more information. So, 197 tons of fish in one fishing ex uh, one fishing trip. 197 tons. A lot of fish. Um, the other thing that I'd like to point out there is the that there those are the toothfish. The, the common name is Chilean sea bass. So if you've ever gone to a restaurant and seen Chilean sea bass or the grocery store, that's exactly what that fish is. It's a toothfish. Uh, the, the market name is Chilean sea bass. Um, it's actually a notothenoid fish. It's very closely related to the, the crazy ice fish we talked about that has clear blood. Um, you can see there from the video that this here is down in the, in the uh, South Pole, so the Antarctic area and very cold water. And so these fish, the, the, the toothfish have red blood. However, they're closely related to the ice fish, which of course has that clear blood that has no red blood cells. So very interesting. When we look then at um, some of the diversity of, of marine fishes, um, we, 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 saw, we see some trends here uh, as far as our distribution. Um, Epipelagic fishes, uh, and these are those that dwell from the surface down to about 200 meters, uh, make up about 1.3% of the total or about 360 species of fish. And so epipelagic are near the surface, but they're in the open water. Deep pelagic fishes, which again are in the deeps down here, you know, so we got sunlight coming in here to the photic zone, and then we got this aphotic zone where it's really dark. Deep pelagic fishes, again, open water in the deeps, about 1,400 species or 5% of the total. And uh, these water co column dwelling fishes can be further subdivided into uh, what we call mesopelagic uh, and bathypelagic. And so the mesopelagic fishes are somewhere from like, say, uh, 200 uh, to 1,000 meters in depth. So up here, Epipelagic are right at the surface. Mesopelagic are right here. And then these bathypelagic fishes are from about 1,000 meters down to about 4,000 meters uh, here in this uh, aphotic zone. Uh, the deep benthic fishes comprise about uh, 1,800 species or 6.4% of the total. And so the deep bentho benthic fishes are kind of like here. They might be found on the continental shelf, but they're in the deep away from the photic zone. So there's no light down here, but they are associated with the continental shelf right here. And then when we talk about the abyssal zone, that is from 4,000 meters to 6,000 meters here, which is, I'm gonna say that's pretty deep in the Hadal zone, named after Hades 
is 6,000 feet to literally the, 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 the bottom surface of the oceans. And this is like pitch black, uh, no light. Sometimes it's not necessarily that cold. You know, when we, talk, when we saw the videos of the coelacanths, especially the ones that were living out here, there's a lot of volcanic activity out here, the ring of fire. There's a lot of volcanic activity deep down and that can actually warm the water down here. And so despite this being very deep, there's a lot of maybe volcanic vents down here that warm the water a little bit. But the littoral or continental shelf right here, the littoral, which is really the epipole, it's the surface along the continental shelf. This is uh, inhabit the shore uh, from 200 meters or sh more shallow than that. The largest group, 45% of all the fishes, 12,600 species of marine fishes right here along the continental shelf. So most of the diversity is here in these highly productive estuaries, shallow water, lots of photosynthesis, lots of light penetration, relatively warm. So lots of diversity there, okay? Some examples of these littoral fishes in the marine environment, blennies, gobies, butterfish, sea scorpions, rockfish, lump suckers, sharks rays, various estuarine species such as mummichogs, sheephead minnows, and striped bass and eels. Uh, things that can sort of live at the interface of the fresh water, uh, you know, where rivers are dumping into things or where bays are. Um, uh, and uh, then also just generally along the continental shelf. And also because the coral reefs are technically, uh, they might be a, a series of, of small islands like these chains of islands, the coral reefs are oftentimes around here, again, in the shallows, relatively shallow. So when we say shallow, we're talking less than 200 meters deep. So lots of habitat variation there as well, um, which is why there's a lot of diversity as well as then part. We look at these deep ocean dwelling fishes. <clears throat> um, this is the considerations here with depth. And so uh, regions and physical features of the deep sea environment uh, relative to the depth are, are related to a lot of physiological adaptations. And so representatives uh, are, are mesopelagic mctophid lantern fishes, the bathypelagic Sir, uh, serratoid angler fishes, the benthopelagic rat tails, and things like this that live on the bottom of the deep, uh, the benthic snail fishes, which are really deep, um, and then the green eyes and things like this. Lots of odd looking stuff down here, uh, you know, when you start getting down here. So here are the mictophids, here are the anglers. And then really down here, when you start getting really down deep here, you might see things like this. Um, uh, many mesopelagic species undergo diurnal vertical migrations called DVMs, and then they, they then swim to shallower waters at dusk. And that's what's shown here by these sort of um, migratory pathways. Uh, mictophids we talked about migrate to the surface to feed, and then there's a lot of predators that follow these things. They're a very important uh, forage basin. And this is our, our sort of a, a, ge a general graph showing what our light penetration is. But the migrations here from the uh, uh, mesopelagic up to the surface are so intense that they actually disrupt military sonar signals. And they're called the deep scattering layer uh, because there's so many fish migrating uh, during certain times of the day that they actually can disrupt sonar. Um, they then return, they come, to, they come to the water at dusk and then feed there at night and then return to the deeps uh, in dawn. Uh, total biomass of living organisms, available light and temperature all decline with depth in the deep sea. So when we look at this, we've got this thermocline here coming down. Once we hit to about a thousand meters in depth, we're looking at pretty much perpetual four degrees centigrade. And in some cases that might drift down is, is called as two degrees centigrade. So again, we talk about how some fishes really get very, this is just, you know, uh, this isn't even, doesn't necessarily even need to be in the, the Arctic or Antarctic. This is just at the deep sea. Uh, and again, some places where there's active volcanic vents, uh, you might, it will not be this cold, it'll be actually warmer. But 
basically pit, once you hit here about 1500 meters in depth, uh, it's about pitch black. There's no light, very cold. And again, this then figure here shows biomass and diversity. Okay. So there's that. When we look at some uh, fishes that may live down here, um, there's lots of odd examples. And so we'll talk first here about open ocean marine fishes towards the surface, the epipelagic. Things like mackerels, requiem and whale sharks, clupeids, uh, herrings and anchovies, salmonids such as salmons, atheriniforms, uh, the flying fishes, again, they're jumping out of the water at the surface, half beaks, sauries, uh, persiforms such as the jacks, the dolphin fish and the palm frets, uh, barracuda, tunas and billfish, uh, like marlins and things like this. Uh, the mesopelagic, things like the lantern fishes, the nyctophids, the opa, uh, ocean sunfishes, long nose, uh, lancet fishes, uh, the barrel eye. Remember the crazy barrel eye that has the clear skull with the eyes inside of its head? Uh, the ridge jaw, the saber tooth. Look at this, the stoplight loose jaw right here. Uh, very odd looking fish. Uh, and the marine hatchet fishes. The bathypelagic, getting very deep here. Uh, the bristle mouth. The angler fishes, the fang tooth, the viper fish, the look at some of these names, the black swallower, uh, telescope fish, the hammer jaw, the dagger tooth, uh, barracadina, uh, the scabbard fishes, the bobtails, snipe eels, the unicorn crest fish. Again, this has this very long spine here. It's a form of defense, so things can't eat it whole. Because down here, you are eat or be eaten. Very little food down here. So uh that's why you see a lot of crazy adaptations like giant jaws. And again, the anglerfish might only find prey once every three months. So you better make sure you eat it. Uh, gulper eels, again, called gulper eels because they got giant jaws. And the wabby, the flabby whale fish. Um, the rat tails and the brochulids are down in the benthopelagic, living on the very bottom in the pitch dark. And then the benthic fishes don't, benthic doesn't necessarily mean, mean to be deep. You know, flat fishes like flounder can live in estuaries, uh, relatively shallow. Uh, hag fishes are deep, however, they prefer to be in the very deep. Uh, we showed those videos of the hag fish. Uh, eel pouts, green eyed eels, stingrays, lump fish, and also the bat fish are benthic. Um, we went around when we talked about the different families, there's lots of examples of these uh, fishes that are adapted for this benthic lifestyle. Uh, here's an example of a lump fish. Uh, a lot of times when you go to the grocery store and buy caviar, especially the cheap caviar, like grocery store caviar, it's most likely made from lump fish. So this is what these things look like. Um, and so if you were studying for an exam, you might I might ask a question like, what kind of fish or what family of fishes might you find in the mesopelagic? And so just be familiar with some of these examples. So with that, I'll show you a video here of the deep sea and some of the animals that live down there. Um, and so here we are living on the ocean floor, benthic deep. A black ghost shark is attracted to the light of the baited remote video system deployed by the Papa scientists. At almost 2000 meters, food is scarce. So the bait is very attractive. The video unit lights up this dark world. The rat tail swims slowly to conserve energy. The green arrows indicate the long filaments that help it to sense food and other animals in the dark. This rat tail was observed below a thousand meters. More than 70 species of rat tails have been recorded in New Zealand waters. Parasitic eels scramble to get the bait, stirring up the sedentary ooze with their frenzy.
the smooth skate is a New Zealand native. Seal sharks are notorious predators and will bite on anything they think could be their next meal. While the hagfish is busy eating the bait, the shark is planning a more animated dinner. When attacked, the hagfish releases a cloud of slime that clogs the shark's gills and chokes it. Hagfish have been around for more than 300 million years, ample time to perfect this effective defense mechanism. The wreckfish, or New Zealand bass, hovers among the coral. Fragile coral habitats provide food and shelter for many marine animals. The deep sea is full of surprises, like this rare shark. So, we look at generally speaking rare life uh in the deep sea uh we're talking about very cold no light not a lot of biomass so if you're a predator you better make sure you can eat something because you might only have one shot at it so a lot of their feeding apparatuses are designed for like a no miss strategy uh, reproduction, like in the case of the anglerfish, is designed so that like the male bites onto you and never lets go because you might never find another male fish ever again. And so to ensure reproductive capabilities, that's a strategy. Um, limited food, uh, you saw limited light. A lot of those animals have very large eyes to take advantage of the very small amount of light that might get down there. And uh, also, uh, notice how slowly a lot of those things were swimming. And that's because you want to conserve your energy um, while you're down there. Because again, you're not, you're not, you don't see anything like swimming fast like a tuna down there because they literally just don't have the biomass to support that kind of metabolism. That, and fishes are poikilotherms. It's very cold. So their metabolic rate is naturally very slow. So here's another uh, video there, rare life on the sea floor. And just sort of take note of some of those adaptations I mentioned there and, 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 and pay attention to finding some of these on your own. There's a fish, there's a rat tail. There's a rat tail down there. Beautiful little scavenger. Very typical of the deep sea. Now rat tail is the rude name. The, the nicer name is grenadier fish. It's a scavenger. It's designed to wait for food that might drop down from the surface. Those massive nasal um, pits it has in front of its eyes are used for tasting the taste of rotting flesh. And it can search out carcasses of dead fish from a long distance. That, that is really nice. That's a chimera, a rabbit fish, beautiful deep sea fish. That is lovely. You can see its shadow. There's a perfect shadow on the sand beneath it. It's lit up by the light here. Such an elegant fish, wonderful fins. Just maneuvering here. You can just see its shadow just down there on the sand. It's lovely. There it goes, there it goes. It's obviously been frightened by the sun. That is very nice. This is wonderful. There's great pillows of lava here. This rock is, geologically speaking, is very, very, very fresh. It's straight out of the although there's a fish. <laughs> that is exquisite, actually. It's got lovely sinusoidal movement of its tail, really beautiful movement. Now, that is all about preserving energy, because if you live down here, you don't get much food. 
and all the fish that live on the sea floor are designed to minimize the amount of energy they use. extraordinary flaps of skin that make them look like the Disney elephant character. They use those flaps to manoeuvre through the water. Dumbo octopuses are deep sea specialists. You only find them right down here. And their tentacles, between their tentacles, they've got these lovely flaps of skin that form a great sort of umbrella which they can use to hover above the seafloor. It's very energy preserving. goes that is that is lovely swimming off now there goes that dumbo so take note of some of those adaptations uh, moving along here we are uh coral reefs so again up towards the surface uh you know, looking a, a little bit uh, in the warmer areas, again, within the Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn. Uh, and you can sort of see here the distribution there. Here is the equator, and then there's 30 north, 30 south. Um, <clears throat> in the shallows, look at this. You can sort of see uh, I mean, there, when we, there's lots of light penetration here. A um, lot different looking than what we just saw in the video. So coral reefs contain the most diverse fish assemblages to be found anywhere on the earth. Uh, perhaps a single reef, for instance, can contain six to 8,000 different species found dwelling within one coral reef ecosystem. And again, the most diverse here uh, around uh, this area here, the, the, the Indian Ocean to the uh, Pacific. Uh, Fishes you might find there, moray eels, sharks, rays, squirrel fishes, snappers, damsel fishes, parrot fishes, sturgeon fishes, surgeon fishes, trigger fishes, goat fishes, the stargazers that hide in the sand, um, trunk fishes, stone fishes, scorpion fishes, uh, lion fishes, again, initially uh, native here and then now an introduction here. Uh, clown fishes uh, with the anemones, uh, butterfly fishes, the barracudas, uh, rabbit fishes, um, damsel fishes, or wrasses, porcupine fishes, the puffers, tetraodontidae, uh, diodontidae, the box fishes, the gobies, angel fishes, seahorses, synathidae, uh, including the pipe fishes, etc. A lot, I mean, I, I'm talking here six to eight thousand species. So, I mean, this is this is by no means an exhaustive list. It's, it's really ridiculous what's here. Um, any of those fishes I talked to you about earlier by families that are a warm, marine, tropical, they have the uh, potential here to be among the coral reefs. So uh, these are the locations here in red, and I'm going to show you now a video of the Great Barrier Reef. From space, the east coast of Australia appears to be in the embrace of a giant opal. The largest living structure on Earth, the Great Barrier Reef, is a lacy, living wall spanning more than 2,000 kilometers of islands and submerged reefs between the Queensland coast and the western edge of the Pacific Ocean. Diving in, the opal seems to splinter into millions of pieces. Whirlpools of small metallic blue fish, barracuda gliding like silver submarines, and occasionally a lone predatory shark. The Great Barrier Reef is like an underwater city whose buildings are alive with millions of small creatures whose lives are intimately and intricately connected. It is as diverse as a rainforest, a mosaic of more than 70 types of habitats hosting thousands of species of marine life. 
as many as a hundred different kinds of coral may occupy a single acre of ocean. Molecule by molecule, coral animals gradually extract calcium carbonate from the surrounding water to form minute stony cups around each animal's soft crown of tentacles. Some corals live in solitary splendor, but most are built with hundreds, sometimes thousands of individual animals linked together to form a single coral mound, plate, or cluster of branches. Some are like little trees and shrubs. They provide food and shelter for thousands of other forms of life. Corals get the credit for most of the reef structure, but much of the construction is done by fast-growing, encrusting red algae. They act like pink glue, cementing fragments of shell, sand, and coral with sheets of calcium carbonate. The reef is home to more than 4,000 kinds of mollusks, from tiny sea slugs, nudibranchs, to giant clams. Green sea turtles travel thousands of miles in the open sea to reach the sandy beaches of some of the barrier reef's islands and there to lay their eggs. Hatchlings head straight for the sea. They will travel thousands of miles over the years and eventually return to lay their own eggs. Established as a national park in 1975, the Great Barrier Reef was designated as a World Heritage Site six years later. Today, about 33% of it is fully protected from fishing and other extractive activities. And efforts are underway to deal with pollution, overfishing, and the consequences of climate change. The Great Barrier Reef appears to be about 20,000 years old but geologists using deep coring techniques have found evidence of ancient corals there that are half a million years old. With care, the future of Australia's living treasure, the Great Barrier Reef, will be at least as enduring as its magnificent past. Pretty cool, Great Barrier Reef. Uh, remarkable uh, ecosystem. So here's our pointer. All right, moving on. Um, when we look at fishes that are designed to live in open ocean pelagic. And so again, I'll, I'll just use this map here for, for the sake of simplicity. So ignore the red dots for now. If you look at the majority of the ocean, right? It's open ocean, just by volume, uh, surface area. Uh, you know, by, or by volume, it's really the really deep ocean, right? But if we just look at like surface area, it's open. It's not along coastline. And I said that majority of fishes live along coastline. And the reason being is that like this quadrant here, whether you're in this corner or this corner or this corner, it's pretty much the same habitat. It's just water for as far as you can see. There's not a lot of diversity there. And so, uh, a lot of fishes that occupy these particular habitats, these uh, open, what we call open ocean pelagics, have very similar body structures because they're just designed to keep swimming through the open water. And look at this, caudal tail, look at the caudal fins. Uh, in the case of the elasmobranchs, uh, you know, the threshers are very fast swimming. The great whites have this isocircle caudal fin, uh, very good swimmers. Uh, the tunas have, uh, again, the lunate caudal fin with finlets. You know this fish can swim. The swordfish can swim. The marlin can swim. The dolphin fish, fast moving on the go. You know, bonitos, yellowtails, all this stuff. The skipjacks, very similar. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll just throw this one out there. It's, it's the unusual one. Uh, the mole is always going to be just uh, just the just the oddball. It open ocean pelagic is a little bit different. 
But generally speaking, these things swim fast. They're all constantly on the move. And so that's what they're doing. It's not like they've got structure out there. Uh, they're at the surface, they're feeding actively, they're very, they're, they're swimming well and fast. That's really what their body is designed to do. So open ocean migratory pelagic species, um, many of the open ocean species occur worldwide in temperate and especially tropical locations. And doesn't matter what their evolutionary relationship is to one another. If you put them all down on the page together, it's like, wow, that's a lot of different cases of very similar convergent evolution. Uh, where you get the same body form appearing over and over again, and it's because they occupy the same niche. Kind of cool. We look at some adaptations. I'm going to give you this one because this is probably, there's two here. I'm going to give you eyes and I'm going to give you uh, swim bladders. So here, there are three spectral classes of cone receptors in the eyes of fishes uh, from lampreys all the way to teleos the bony fishes. And I told you before that light attenuates at depth and that the deeper you go, the less light penetrates. And so that's what this is showing. Decreasing down dwelling light at depth. And this is the depth. So littorals at the surface all the way down here to this abyssal or hadal down here. And uh, we talked about how uh, the longer, uh, see, long wavelengths, long, long uh, wavelength light in the visible spectrum. So, for instance, the reds and the greens, which are from 495 to 570 nanometers, they attenuate first. So, they don't penetrate all that deep. The deepest penetrating ones are the short wavelength, the blues and the violets, which is also why water appears blue. And so, if, if, if sunlight if the red spectrum attenuates here, the blue spectrum can penetrate further, which is why they shaded blue down here. Also, that's why red is a form of camouflage in the deep sea. We showed, I showed a slide, a story about how red is actually camouflaged down there. Now, the other thing that, that shifts here is the eye pigments of the fish. So for instance, if you're at the surface, you can see red light. So for instance, you might have eye pigments here that allow you to recognize uh, blues, yellows, and oranges, and reds. And so you might have an eye pigment that's designed to be excited here at these wavelengths. But if you're down here, you don't need that because red light's not even getting down to you. So what happens is, is the, the pigment of your eyes shift so that you're really only able to see blues and maybe a little bit of the green. And so that's what these little these little round things are the, uh, the wavelength. It just sort of tells you what the, the maximum excitation wavelength is for the eye pigment. And so you see the shift. As you get deeper, the eyes are designed to see wavelengths of shorter uh, wavelength, light rather, of shorter wavelength. Uh, likewise, these, these round circles here are the, uh, uh, the cones that are able to see the colors, like reds, yellows, and things like that where these black bars are the rods that are designed to see darker. They're, just right, they're, really just desi they're really just distinguishing light from no light. So it's like black, white. But even then they shift so that they're detecting more short wavelength uh, light. And so it's pretty cool. Um, you can see the eyes have evolved in fishes to adapt to the wavelengths of light that penetrate to the depth of their habitats. Very interesting. So these are adaptations, visual adaptations to living in the deep sea. Another one is the, the presence or absence of a swim bladder. Now, I told you that nearly all freshwater teleosts, bony fishes, have some kind of functional swim bladder, whether that's a physostome, where the swim bladder is attached to the esophagus, or a physocleist, where there's a gas gland that fills that swim bladder with molecular oxygen. Now, the freshwater fishes, I don't care, the deepest freshwater fish is not dealing with something like 4,000 meters. I mean, Lake Superior is what, 1,300 feet deep? That's it. That's nothing. Uh, and so if you think about it, there's not, there's not a whole lot of physostomes living at 4,000 meters deep because that means if you want to swim your, or if you want to fill your swim bladder, you're going to swim all the way to the surface to gulp a little air and then go all the way down. No way you're doing that. Just, it's not, you're not doing that. So 
The distribution of swim bladders and marine fishes varies with their habitat and the depth at which their life history takes them. So the increased pressure in the deep also makes it difficult to inflate the swim bladder because pressure is constantly crushing down on these things. And so putting air inside of the swim bladder might not be the best strategy. That's why sometimes like the coelacanth fills it with fat because fat is not compressible like gas. So fishes that make diurnal vertical migrations, whereas our, our, our myctophids and our mesopelagic, right? The lantern fishes, myctophidae. These arrows say that they're doing vertical migrations. Um, they may retain a swim bladder because, you know, they need to adjust their buoyancy because they might be in the shallows feeding at night, come down deeper during the day. Uh, and so they might need to regulate their buoyancy. And so they might have a, a normal swim bladder. Sometimes they have a reduced swim bladder. Um, some of those are bioluminescent as well because they're moving up and down the water column. Uh, however, bathypelagic fishes may retain a swim bladder. For instance, if they want to make sure that they're, they, they, they might retain a swim bladder, but in a lot of cases, they just say, you know what, if we're living on the bottom, why do we need to learn? Well, we don't need to worry about floating. Or in the case of the anglerfishes, we're just going to maintain neutral buoyancy. We're not, the anglerfish is not swimming up or down in the water column, so it doesn't need to change its buoyancy. Anymore. It just needs to hang out at its water column depth. Uh, where, whereas a lot of epipelagic fishes that might live at the surface and then swim down, you know, again, we're looking at these fishes that live 200 meters or deep uh, or, or, you know, from the surface down to only 200 meters, very common to have swim bladders here, uh, including the physostoma swim bladders. Down here, if you've got a swim bladder, you're a physocleist 100% of the time. There are no physostomes down here. They're all physocleists. Now, we talked about tunas. Uh, tunas basically just, they constantly swim. And so they, they have kind of an odd swim bladder. The marlins and things like that also have, a, they have a swim bladder, but the marlins have a very odd swim bladder. It's almost like packing material. It's a lot of like these little bubbles uh, that, are, that, are, that are filled with gas. So lots of variation there in swim bladder structure, but no, deep sea fishes, there are no physostomes, only physocleists. The physostomes are up here at the surface. And in some cases, you can fill that swim bladder with fat if you're really deep, as opposed to, to gas, or you just don't even have one. Um, and it sort of depends on your life history. And so I can go through hundreds of these examples, but this figure sort of tells you, uh, usually absent in the deep, often absent in the mesopelagic, often present near the surface, okay? And with that, I've got one last slide before I go into the story. And uh, this one here is just to sort of illustrate some other adaptations. We talked about uh, fake eyes and camouflage of eyes, like cryptic coloration. It's designed to confuse predators. It's also designed to confuse prey because you don't know what's the eating end of this thing. Like if I'm a small fish swimming by, do I avoid this side or that side? I don't really know. And if I choose the wrong side, boom, I get eaten. Um, the Wobegong carpet shark has all these, look at this crazy chin this thing has, very well camouflaged, right? Benthic fish, you can hardly, I mean, it, it matches its substrate very well. Uh, flounders can mimic the, the, the coloration of the substrate using chromatophores in the skin. And they actually can change color. If you take a flounder, like if you put this flounder here on uh, sand, it will mimic the sand. But if you take the flounder out and put it on a checkerboard, it'll try to mimic the checkerboard. Look at that. It does a pretty good job. That's amazing. I mean, that's a pretty good job at mimicking the checkerboard. And they can do this actually in a matter of minutes. So if you move them from one habitat to the other, they actually can do this in a matter of minutes. Um, and so very unique. And so I'm gonna show one video here of the flounder and then uh, I'll tell you the story. Mobile's been building its 5G network for a moment like this. All right. Sorry, here it is.
flounder. The very word makes the fish seem helpless and confused. And that's just what they want you to think. Their thin bodies and camouflaged scales help them look like the seabed. Once within range, they strike with sudden speed. This is a shrimp, AKA dinner. The flounder hides under a thin covering of sand. Only its eyes peek out. Strangely enough, when a flounder is born, its eyes are on either side of its body. As it matures, one eye migrates to the other side, giving it the characteristic flat shape that allows it to hide so well. The shrimp senses danger, but it's too late. But the flounder's hungry movements don't go undetected. This osprey senses an easy snack. The flounder attempts to disguise itself again, but the sands are too sparse and the water too shallow. The eater is eaten and the cycle of life continues. While other better disguised flounder live on. Very good camouflage there. So with that, I will give a story. So here it is. Uh, you learned it here, AEC 441. Monsters of the Deep. So fangtooths uh, are pelagic uh, bericiform fish, uh, family Anoplogasteridae that live in the deep, 5,000 meters, 16,000 feet deep. They have the largest fang-like teeth of any fish in the ocean proportionate to body size. Look at the length of the teeth here. Uh, the teeth are actually so large that they can never fully close their mouths. They like literally swim around like this. They, they can't close their mouths. Uh, the largest two fangs of the lower jaw uh, are so long that they have evolved sockets in the base of the skull here that, that allow a portion of this tooth to slide into the base of the skull so they can partially close their mouth. And these two fangs then slide along either side of their brain. Uh, despite their ferocious appearance, they're only uh, about 18 centimeters long, so about seven inches. Uh, the wide expansion of the mouth allows them to swallow very large prey items, like here. Um, and they undergo diurnal migrations, remaining in the deep during the day and then rising to feed by starlight at night. Again, sort of joining that deep scattering layer area where there's a lot of other stuff moving at that time to feed. And so that's an opportune time to pick off a prey item. And again, deep sea strategies these teeth are designed so that once you bite onto something, it's not getting away. That's what they're designed to do. So with that, uh, here's a video of the thing. Join us on a journey to the very bottom of the deep sea, to an alien world never revealed before. It's home to some of the strangest animals on earth. Fish flash in the darkness. New species are discovered on almost every dive. More people have traveled into space than have ventured this deep. Come on a journey into the abyss. Relative to body size, these are the largest teeth in the ocean. They're so big that their owner can't even close its mouth.
They belong to the Fang Tooth. Unlike most deep sea fish, this has powerful muscles and is an aggressive hunter. With food in such short supply at this depth, dark zone predators have to be able to deal with a meal of almost any size. Many animals here are dark red, like this deep sea jelly. Caught in the lights of the submersible, it's a spectacular firework display of color. And so dark red again <clears throat> is pretty difficult to see. So with that, um, I will stop recording here and I will entertain questions. Stop there, yep, stop there and stop here. <laughs>